This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's long table. And uh, we've, we've got a presentation today by Mike Moran, somebody I've gotten to know over the last several years while serving together on the Coin Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee. Um, Mike has served on this committee for over a decade, I believe. Yeah, I do. And I have to say that um, during the time that we spent together down in Washington and uh, elsewhere in Philadelphia, uh, Mike is mighty fine company, really have uh, enjoyed getting to know him. So as, as many of you I'm sure know, Mike is an award-winning numismatic author, lecturer, and researcher. Um, he's won a good number of awards. His article on the survival of the San Francisco Mint during the Great Earthquake of 1906 won the, the ANA's 2006 Heath Literary Award. He uh, also won the P&G's prestigious Robert Friedberg Award for his 450-page uh, master work, at least uh, so far the master work. He's got another one in progress, a book on. called Striking Change on the artistic collaboration between Theodore Roosevelt and Augustus St. Gaudens. And he also won the Numismatic Literary Guild Awards uh, Best U.S. Coin Book for um, the book 1849, The Philadelphia Mint Strikes Gold, which he co-authored with um, Jeff Garrett. Uh, Mike is also a uh, former chair and advisor on the board of the Art Museum at the University of Kentucky and also is serving on the board of trustees of the Theodore Roosevelt um, Association. And uh, in his spare time, he's a businessman active in lumber, oil, and gas industries. And today he's going to be giving us something of a preview of a forthcoming book that will be published by Whitman and as well as a forthcoming uh, ANS Magazine article, something which uh, we're just uploading today and you should have in your hands in just a few weeks, um, a, a talk called Theodore Roosevelt and Gold Coin Designs of 1907-08, an analysis of presidential decisions. So Mike, all yours. Well, thank you, Peter. I, I sincerely hope I do as well as you did with that introduction. Uh, that was flurry. Now, what he failed to say, though, is, yeah, I'm good company because Peter buys me wine. <laughs> Here, Mike, have another glass of wine and entertain us some more about some of the things that went on behind the scenes at the CCAC. Oh, yeah, there you go. There's plenty of that. Uh, one thing that you, uh, I will add is I'm also secretary of the association, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Association, and on their uh, executive right. committee. So you're getting kind of uh, my experience on both the uh, coin side and on the political side here. And I also add that you're going to get some of my insights on the political side, because I went through the, you call it the school of hard knocks or from the ground floor up in terms of the work that I did uh, getting the Morgan and the Peace Dollar legislation through that was passed on January the 5th of uh, 2021. Uh, that's an entire another story we're not going to go into today. But what I want to do today is I suspect every one of you knows at least some, if not all, of the story uh, of St. Gaudens dealing with the Met to get his gold coin designs through in 1905, six and seven. Uh, and you may even know some of the history prior to that uh, of the sour notes, sour grapes between the engraver Charles Barber and the sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens. But I'm gonna give you a little different take on it today uh, that I don't think anybody else is really focused on as much as they should. And that's the take from Theodore Roosevelt. And for, Basically, we should because he's the client here. And it's not often that you have a client that is the president of the United States. Uh, I chose this image of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, done by Gary Melchers in 1908, because it really shows the man at the height of his power. Um, but there's a lot of uh, interesting byplay or for, uh, that goes on to get him to this point in 1908, just before he finishes his second term. Uh, what, what this, the story really starts on December the 27th of 1904 in terms of the written record. And that's when he, uh, uh, Roosevelt writes to the Secretary of the Treasury, Leslie Shaw, and says, I think her coinage is artistically of atrocious hideousness. Um, say, Roosevelt was good at a quote, and he certainly does it here. 
And he goes on, can we employ a man like St. Gaudens to give us coinage that will give us some beauty? And the answer he gets back from Shaw is that uh, the amendments to the uh, statutes of 1890 allowed the uh, Secretary of the Treasury to change the coin designs every 25 years. So the answer was, and he just did a, a very cursory look at the legislation, that Roosevelt had the ability to change the gold coins and the one cent piece. And so Roosevelt decides to move forward on that. He basically did not like the existing designs, particularly on the $20 gold piece. His comment was he thought the gold coins looked like a grilled squab. He didn't like grilled squab because there was never enough there for a man to eat. So, Let me get back up here again. He springs his trap right after the diplomatic reception in January of 1905. There's a, a dinner after the reception. St. Gons is invited to the reception, shows up, and had, he's also invited to the dinner and finds out he's seated at Theodore Roosevelt's table. He should have been uh, wary of that because Theodore Roosevelt had set a trap for him. Also at that table was Leslie Shaw, the Secretary of the Treasury. They get to talking about the Greek coins and the high relief on the Greek, Greek coins and how great it was. And Roosevelt says, St. Gaudens, if you design those coins or a, a coin like that, I'll have the Mets strike it. Well, Gus was not expecting that whatsoever. Uh, and then Roosevelt says, you know, this is my pet crime. St. Gaudens gave as good as he got that night. He basically said to, to Roosevelt that he anticipated problems with the men. He had troubles with the engraver there, and he was worried that that uh, might not be a very good solution. As a result of that, Roosevelt blustered that if the engraver got in the way, he would take his head off. And he said, uh, St. Gaudens, you know, this is my pet crime. Well, Yes, it was his pet crime, but you have to be careful about that because Theodore Roosevelt was a highly intelligent man and he did not do anything spur of the moment in spite of what you might think. There was more to it than that. Uh, when St. Gordon showed up the next day, Roosevelt was ready for him. Now, we don't know what was said in there in terms of the charge from the client to the sculptor, but I think you can reconstruct some, some of what Roosevelt probably said. He was quoted in the campaign of 1896 when he was trailing the Democratic nominee for president, uh, William Jennings Bryan, in Detroit. He said, we are citizens of the Republic ever brightened by the rays of the morning. And those of you that are familiar with the design that comes out, that, that statement rings a real bell. But there was more to it than that as far as what uh, Roosevelt would have liked to, to see on the, the coins. He felt that St. Gaudens Sherman, that is at the corner of 59th and, and uh, Fifth Avenue at the entrance to uh, Central Park was one of the best uh, statues of a commander in existence. And he said that the pairing of the general with an allegorical figure strikes the very highest note in sculptor's art. That, that basically is true. Uh, what that shows from is that Roosevelt was an extremely good critic of art. And he had every reason to believe that that was a, a good work because it, it is. And it's one of the best that's ever been done in terms of marrying the, the allegory to, to the reality of Sherman. We also know from past or, or for subsequent correspondence that Theodore Roosevelt also brought up the idea of an American Indian, a Native American, he thought would be a suitable uh, rendition or, or, or likeness for uh, liberty on an American coin. So just what was the president's motivation when you get right down to it? Was it a pet crime or was there more to it? In my opinion, you have to go back to the 1904 election uh, in November. Roosevelt's uh, Democratic opponent in that election was Alton Parker, 
uh, who was nominated from the Gould Wing of the Democratic Party. Roosevelt crushed him. Uh, there was no contest whatsoever, but uh, on election night, Roosevelt was uh, started out on pins and needles, but as the results came in, it was going to be a big landslide. Uh, very early in the evening, in fact, at nine o'clock that evening, he got the telegram from Parker conceding the election. So Roosevelt goes into the, his office, summons the White House press corps. They're there for a comment. He brings in his secretary, William Loeb. He proceeds to say that his first three and a half years in office after the assassination of President McKinley, he would treat as his first term in office. And that this has, would be therefore his second term and he would stand by the tradition that no pr uh, president would hold office for more than two terms. Well, his wife, Edith, was seen to gasp right there. Uh, he hadn't told anybody this. This was just right off the cuff and in the euphoria of, of the election victory and how overwhelming it was. But what he'd done for in all practical purposes was to make himself a four-year lame duck. The Republicans that wanted to jockey for his position were going to snipe at him. The Democrats were going to snipe at him no matter what. And it was going to make him make a very difficult situation for him to govern throughout his second term. The only way he could avoid this was to find an heir apparent as quickly as possible that would carry on his policies and ensure to the best of his ability that his heir apparent was going to be in a position to win the election of 1908. That would remove the lame duck status from Theodore Roosevelt. And when you look at that situation and realize how badly he beat the gold wing of the Democratic Party, you knew that the silver wing was going to come back into ascendancy with the, the Democrats in 08. And it was all in all likelihood going to be William Jennings Bryan, who had lost in 96 and 1900 to William McKinley. That meant, from Theodore Roosevelt's point of view, in the fall of 1904 and the winter of 1905, that silver was going to be an issue again, just like it had been in 96 and 1900. So you really have to take a, a second look at what Theodore Roosevelt is up to here. He basically is going after William Jennings Bryan and one of the campaign issues. To him, gold was something of value, and he needed to get it into the consciousness of American people and therefore weaken the position that silver had had in the previous uh, two elections, as well as throughout the decade of the 1890s. So to me, and I think you can make a very strong case for this, the true meaning of, or true motivation of Roosevelt redesigning the coins was to remove silver as a campaign issue as best he could in the 08 election. So at the end of that, meeting. St. Gons tells Theodore Roosevelt he'll think about it. The reason he's going to think about it is because Roosevelt has thrown another commission on him, and one that he would just basically hate because of its terms and conditions. The start of it was a letter from Frank Millett, an artist in his own right, to Edith Roosevelt, uh, complaining about the mediocre inaugural medal that was coming out of the Mint for the 1905 inauguration. It was basically a redo of the one they'd hurriedly put together in 1902 when Roosevelt assumed the office the first time. And the phrase that really capped it off for Edith was when Millard asked, doesn't Theodore Roosevelt deserve a medal at least as good as the one that Millard Fillmore got? And that was it right there. There was no turning the president down on this, but St. Gaudens, for St. Gaudens, it was everything he hated. One, the original concept of the medal was going to be too small. Uh, two, the budget was too tight. And three, there was a deadline, March 4th of 1905. He hated all three. The way he sidestepped it was to tell Theodore that he would provide the design. To him, that was nine tenths of the uh, execution of the coin anyway, and that he would give the modeling order to Adolf Wyman and Wyman would carry it to fruition. And that's exactly what did happen. Uh, however, it didn't happen on March 4th, of course. Uh, the uh, bronze uh, image, bronze medal, 
actually got to Theodore Roosevelt in July. Uh, the one you see here is uh, worth a special note. It's one that I have in my collection. Uh, you, you see some of these medals pop up from time to time in auctions where there's a handwritten note from TR to somebody, quite often it's somebody that was in the press corps at that point in time, giving them one of these medals. This one is not one of those medals. It came down through the family. Uh, Theodore gave it to his brother or his son, Archie, who turned around and gave it to Archie Jr., who turned around in the 1970s and sold it to Neil McNeil. Now, Neil McNeil was an AP reporter who was also a, a collector of presidential memorabilia. And uh, this coin was the front piece on his book that he wrote on the presidential coin, uh, medals. Uh, at the time that it was over there in Oyster Bay, Edith Roosevelt was writing a letter to Augusta St. Gaudens saying how much she loved the coin, the likeness of, of her husband on the obverse as well as the eagle on the reverse. And she's holding it in her hand and, and as she writes the note and, and very deeply touched by it. St. Gaudens gets this note and is flustered completely by it. Uh, is this the uh, medal that she was holding? I think in all likelihood from what I know of the family today that it is, but I'm not sure I can't actually claim that, but I'd like to if I could. Anyhow, once the medal is complete, Augusta St. Gaudens knows that Theodore Roosevelt does indeed carry a big stick and that he will be able to carry through and help St. Gaudens execute his designs at the Met. So, uh, in a minute here, uh, there we go. So, in July of 1905, he commits. And nothing happens. Nothing happens until November when Roosevelt asks and says, what is happening? At this point, Gus is going to have to give him some general idea of what he's thinking about. And what he says is that on one side, he's thinking of liberty, perhaps winged, striding energetically forward as if on a mountaintop. I can tell you that if you're familiar with the uh, uh, Sherman Monument in, in Central Park, that's exactly the head of victory. And he wanted it to be a real thing, a symbol of progress. Well, Roosevelt writes back and says, well, can you put a feather headdress on that liberty? So Gus is probably groaning at that. He, he did not really reply to that because the next thing he wanted to do was deal with the inscriptions. The St. Gaudens, in all of his work, this was best when it came to inscriptions. Keep it simple and keep the uh, field as clean as possible. Uh, so he went after the inscription in God We Trust. He asked if he really needed to have it there. The answer from Roosevelt was no, it was not required by law. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, it was not that he was irreligious at all. It's just that he strongly believed in separation of church and state, and he was not a supporter of a motto, a religious motto on our coins. So for him, it was an easy decision to make. If St. Gaudens wanted to take it off there, take it off there. So here we sit into Christmas 1905. Meanwhile, not much has been done in terms of the model. Uh, St. Gaudens is tied up at this point with the Franklin Medal that was originally uh, uh, for his brother to do. His brother had left the medal that fall for St. Gaudens to finish up. Uh, it was to be done by April 1906, and it was to celebrate the bicentennial of the birth of Benjamin Franklin. So he's starting to feel the pressure of that deadline and giving it a considerable amount of his time. Nevertheless, he's not going to be able to put off the president uh, when uh, Roosevelt again at Christmas wants to know where things are. So he says at this point that he's far enough along with the design that he wants to use a Roman eagle on the reverse. He had originally considered a flying eagle. Gus liked the old flying eagle penny. In fact, it was his favorite coin design for the United States up to that point in time. However, he told Roosevelt he was thinking of the angel of victory off the uh, Sherman Monument now. And if he put a flying eagle on the back, he had a problem. Simply put, there were too many feathers from the angel wings and the eagle wings put together. So 
That's where he was. He started work on this in January and then things stopped. The reason they stopped was that he was having a relapse, a recurrence of his cancer. St. Gaudens had come down with him and been diagnosed with intestinal cancer in 1900. Uh, he'd had surgery to remove the, the tumor, but it resulted in his having had a colostomy. He was now having problems with a blockage and he was in severe pain. Nothing got done on the uh, design for Roosevelt. January, February, and finally in March, the pain got too great for St. Gaudens and he went to Boston for surgery. He had the blockage removed. Uh, there were two surgeons that attended. One said that the cancer was not there. It was uh, not, it could be another five years before it came back that everything had been removed. The other surgeon told uh, St. Gaudens' wife that the cancer was gonna come back a whole lot sooner. Gus was not told this, by the way. His recovery was really slow. April turned into May before he started work again. Um, and in the meantime, the family was not willing to tell Roosevelt that St. Gaudens was ill. Uh, he had no idea just how badly off St. Gaudens was. Uh, but still, Gus started to work on the models. And he told St. Uh, Roosevelt that he had the standing eagle done, but he was going to send it to Paris for multiple reductions uh, in terms of the uh, relief on the eagle to, so that he had some flexibility as to what he was going to ultimately end up with for a relief on the reverse. What he was really doing here was he did not want Barber, Charles Barber, to touch his models. He wanted the reverse to be reduced in Paris. In fact, he wanted the, his models to be fully reduced in Paris and then have the finished product presented to the men. So at this point, he is no longer even able to carry on correspondence with Theodore Roosevelt. It has fallen to his son, Homer. And Homer lets the cat out of the bag that the reverse model is in Paris and that uh, Gus is still working on the uh, obverse, but Homer's willing to show it to uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt as soon as everything's back in Paris. And that happens in September. What you have here is the model. And in this case, you can see it's for, uh, for the denomination of $20. From this point forward, it's really not a, a a design for the gold coins in total, but the focus, the primary focus is on the double eagle. You have the feathers on the, the um, victory. You have the feather headdress. Uh, it's not bold, but it really doesn't add anything whatsoever to the design. And in fact, it results in the, the design being reduced somewhat to fit within the diameter of the uh, gold coin. Homer also brought along St. Gaudens, get it here in a minute. St. Gaudens designed for the obverse of the one cent piece, the other half of the commission. Here is St. Gaudens flying eagle. Theodore Roosevelt falls in love with it. And he's not concerned about too many feathers. He wants to see that on the back of the double eagle. The other kink that Roosevelt throws into this situation is the dies have got to be cut at the U.S. Mint. That's de uh, declared by law. Roosevelt had no flexibility in that whatsoever. So coming out of that meeting, Gus has two problems. He's gonna have to find some way to minimize the touches that Par Charles Barber makes on his model. And he's got to redo the obverse of his double eagle. And he's got to come back from scratch, although he doesn't address this at this point. He doesn't have a one cent design anymore. Theodore Roosevelt has wiped that one out. So he has Henry Herring there at his Cornish studio to help him work through the, the changes he's got to make on the obverse model. And he also lobbies Theodore Roosevelt to acquire the latest in the reducing lathes, and this being the John Vier machine out of Paris. He had seen the, the uh, John Vier lathe and what it could do uh, that had actually been applied in, in 1905 to the Franklin model, Franklin metal, to the model of the Franklin metal. 
And he, uh, this one required very little of any hand tooling by the engraver once it had been put into the grade in the engraving re reduction machine. At the Mint, you had the Hill machine, which was put in place in 1869, and it was rudimentary at best. Now, there was a lot of hand tooling required and inscriptions that needed to be added uh, by the engraver. So St. Gaudens was successful with Theodore Roosevelt. They brought the new uh, John VA machine in, and all of a sudden, Charles Barber was out of his comfort zone. He was going to have to learn the new machine. In the meanwhile, at Cornish, Gus gets the uh, models ready to go for the, or the model ready to go for the obverse, as well as the reverse on uh, using the Flying Eagle. And at the end of December, just before Christmas, he sends the models, and I'll, I'll show you rather than the model, I'm going to show you the, actually what came out of it after the trial strikes. And this is your, what's known today as the Ultra High Relief Double Eagle. It's a beautiful piece. You can see that the uh, drapery, drapery flows, the hair flows, the uh, wind in the, uh, moves the uh, flame in the torch. There's motion there, and Liberty is as if she's striding forward to a mountaintop. The eagle's beautiful on the back. The problem that you have with this is, first of all, Barber's not ready for it. He can't engrave it because he doesn't know how to use the John VA machine. So he's got to bring Henri Weil, the man who uh, installed the machine in the first place in Philadelphia, back to actually do the reductions for him. They aren't ready until February. When they do them, the die fails uh, after several strikes. And it's a complete disaster in that you cannot strike this coin uh, or this gold piece on a uh, coin press made just for the general circulation coins. It takes a metal press to, and multiple strikes to bring up the design. So it's not going to work. The relief is too high. Uh, so Gus knows he's got to come back with a second design or second uh, model reducing the relief. And he's still got the issue of the one cent piece. Meanwhile, he's so sick, he can hardly get out of the bed to go to the studio. Uh, he can only spend minutes, as much as an, no more than an hour in the studio. So he's not going to do an entirely new design for the one cent piece. He's got no choice but to pull something off of the shelf. And what he pulls off of the shelf is a uniface that he calls Victory Peace. And it's based on the head of the Angel of Victory that you see there in the round. The metal that he's pulling it from is a uniface. He takes this and comes up with the model that you see on the left here. This is the model that he proposes and sends to Theodore Roosevelt in February. Well, immediately up comes Theodore with the Indian headdress. Please, on just one coin, can we have the Indian headdress? Well, you can say no to a client, but saying no to the President of the United States, who's your client, is a different story. You really can't. St. Gaudens came back and said, yes, I'll do it. And you see the model on the left with the full Indian headdress. It's a good model, but is it as good as the one on the, in terms of the image of liberty, is it as good as the one on the left? That's up to, to the viewer. In my opinion, it's not. And in the opinion of a lot of art critics, it is not. But it's still not anything to be sneezed at. So on March the 12th, this model with the headdress goes to the Met along with the second model for the double eagle in a lower relief. Immediately, Barbara begins the reductions and St. Gaudens then changes his mind about what might or might not work for the double eagle. That tells me that St. Gaudens had real fears that this second model might not work either because the relief was very little different from the first model. So he asked for permission from St. Gaudens. I've got to skip ahead here. Ah, 
to do a trial piece that combines the flying eagle with liberty and feather headdress. What he did here basically was to combine the, the two pieces, the two models into a coin for Roosevelt to see that he thought would be Roosevelt's favorites. Uh, I would argue that also St. Gaudens was trying to get this commission to completion because he knew by this point in time he was failing. So Barber, early May, puts together what becomes known as the High Relief Double Eagle. Uh, and this one you see is, is a piece that came out of the issue of, of December when they were actually striking them. But it gives you an idea of the design that, that uh, in terms of the model that St. Gaudens presented to uh, the men in, in March. Uh, it is artistically uh, superior to the first model in that the silhouette of the capital dome is stronger. St. Gaudens has added an additional fold into the uh, drapery. Uh, he did that not only to give it a, artistically a better look, but also to smooth the transition from the high relief of Liberty's leg into the uh, field beyond the uh, flow of the skirt. Um, this one failed just as badly as the first model. Uh, there was some despair on Roosevelt's part at this point in time. He wrote St. Gaudens saying, can you try one with Liberty striding across the coin rather than uh, uh, standing straight forward or, or striding forward as you have now? Gus told him there's no time. Uh, and besides, the original concept was meant to be just exactly what it is, Liberty striding forward, not across the coin. Meanwhile, Gus sends Henry Herring to Philadelphia to see another trial strike. The reason for the second trial strike is that the superintendent of the Mint, John Landis, had come to the director of the Mint, George Roberts, and said, we really should try to reduce the relief from this second model by the 20%, the maximum amount that you can reduce it using the John VA machine and see what we get. Again, Barber was out of his comfort zone. What they got was a model that was not particularly distinct in terms of the sharpness of the image, but they certainly did get one that was of a lower relief. Uh, in mid-May, Herring came to the Met and they did the trial strike. And what they saw was enough information that a third model they felt all, all around had a good chance of being successful. Herring then went to Theodore Roosevelt at the White House and reported. So Theodore at this point knows that a third model will work. So he meets with George Roberts on May the 25th. Prior to that meeting by two days, Roberts had received a letter from St. Gaudens saying that he felt like the standing liberty in combination with the Roman Eagle, the original concept that he had, was the one that would work best. Roberts agreed with him. The reason Roberts agreed is they both felt like it would coin up. So Roberts comes to the meeting with this proposal. Theodore Roosevelt comes to the meeting feeling like his proposal or his favored combination has a high probability of working with a third model. And I can tell you who won that conversation. Uh, Roosevelt basically told Roberts that they, they would do a third model, and this was the, his final word on the subject. But then he did something different. He also said, well, in a spirit of compromise, let's do a $10 gold coin, and let's take the Indian head, the Liberty and Indian headdress with that standing eagle, and we'll combine those for the $10 gold coin. So now you've got a third model, having be done in Cornish on the double eagle plus an original first model for a $10 gold piece using the feathered headdress with Liberty and the standing eagle. The $10 gold piece model is the easiest to do and that one goes to the mint first in June. And Barber quite frankly has very little trouble with it. It coins up reasonably well. Let me get up here.
The only trouble he had in it was that the points of the stars had a tendency to bleed into the rim of the coin. And, and the image you see here is the wire rim uh, eagle coin. Uh, there was a trial piece struck that was sent to St. Gaudens on June the 22nd. As far as I know, it is the only actual gold coin that St. Gaudens ever saw of either of his designs. Right after that, the Mint went into a summer shutdown period uh, and the Mint staff went on vacation and nothing in July was done. Uh, that's a shame. Although on the other hand, uh, Herring didn't have the third model of Double Eagle ready yet either, but nothing was done on either the Eagle or the Double Eagle coins. St. Gaudens, meanwhile, on uh, the 1st of August slips into a coma and dies on August the 3rd. So now then, Roosevelt's on his own. And what he does, he calls in Barber from vacation and he says, you will strike these coins 500 each of what you have in hand in terms of the models. That meant the high relief double eagle and the what we call the wire rim $10 gold piece. And therein you have the rarity of the $10 gold piece born. Uh, Barber subsequently would put a rolled rim on this $10 gold piece, which would improve the strikeability and show the inscriptions and, and particularly the stars on the rim better. Meanwhile, Herring is off on his own at Cornish without a lot of direction, preparing a second $10 gold piece model, as well as the third double eagle model. The uh, second $10 gold piece model comes in in September, is excellent. Uh, Barber uh, reduces it to a die and it becomes a, uh, the production piece and actually goes into production in November. Meanwhile, the Double Eagle still won't strike up in spite of everybody's optimism that it would. Um, again, and, and part of the reason that uh, there wasn't any direction in August or September coming from uh, Washington, as well as the fact that St. Gaudens was gone, was that uh, George Roberts, the director of the Met, had retired from the Met, effective July 31, and the new director of the Met, um, Frank Leach, uh, was delayed in getting on the job, and in fact, he would not get there until the 1st of November. So the $10 gold piece comes out, and the first thing people notice is it has no model. Immediately a firestorm develops on that and continues to rage. Meanwhile, uh, Frank Leach is dealing with modifications to the third model in order to get it to strike. In December, all this comes to a head. Roosevelt authorizes an issue, which only turns out to about to be about 12,000 pieces of the high relief double eagle. The ultra high relief double eagle kind of hangs out there. No decision was ever made on it. It never gets put into any kind of limited production. And the ones that were struck are sitting there uh, uh, to be leaked out into collector hands over time. And the 500 wire rim, $10 gold pieces come out as well during this time period, as well as the issue of the standard issue coming off the coin presses of the double eagle. You can see that a lot is lost in the beauty, and yet a lot is retained here. You still have a flowing motion. Uh, the sun rays are, are a little too spiky, uh, and they compete with the eagle on the reverse, but it still is a good eagle that appears uh, in a dimension away from the dimension of the sun and the sun rays. Uh, it's good, but at this point, when you compare it to the uh, double eagle, Roosevelt got into a lot of trouble over this model in the spring, the lack of the model, I mean, and, and caught a lot of grief from even his friends on it. Uh, they called the $10 gold piece better than the, the old design with the Head of Liberty, but not good enough. And they said that he had shocked the people by the removal of the motto of In God We Trust. Roosevelt caves in because if he doesn't, He's done two things to hurt himself. He's not eliminated or, or the strategy to eliminate the silver issue by calling attention to the gold coins has backfired. And the second part of that issue is 
he's given the Democrats an issue by taking the motto off the coins. Roosevelt caves and the motto comes on the coins in May of 1970. Meanwhile, he's faced with the $5 gold piece and the $2.5 gold piece. The thinking when Roberts met with Roosevelt on May the 25th of 07 was that the $10 gold piece with the uh, Indian headdress on Liberty with the standing eagle would be applied to the smaller gold coins. It is for uh, those two coins a superior design to the double eagle because the double eagle just simply doesn't reverse from the size of a double eagle down to the size of a uh, a $5 gold piece, which is the size of a nickel, or the, the quarter eagle, which is the size of a dime. It, it, it is a disaster. But with the tepid re, uh, response to the design of the $10 gold piece in the, in the public forum, the decisions made to downsize the design from the double eagle. They actually went so far by April of 08 to have struck a uh, pattern piece using the standing liberty. That's gone. It went to the melting pot. I would have liked to have at least seen or seen a photograph of it or seen it in the Smithsonian collection, but it, it is gone. But meanwhile, a friend of Roosevelt's comes to the White House for lunch. His name is William Sturgis Bigelow. Uh, he has an idea for the smaller gold coins. He will do what it's called, an, he is going to propose an incus design in which the uh, main design elements set below the field of the coin itself. That way he can do, you can do high relief in it, but you also don't have to worry about these coins stacking because the field is flat. And that was one of the complaints the bankers had that high relief made it difficult to stack the coins and therefore to count them. Uh, uh, Sturgis then brings in the artist, Bela Pratt. Pratt had been a student of St. Gaudens at the Art Students League. And Pratt comes up with a beautiful head of liberty, Native American with the feather headdress, lo and behold, as well as a realistic standing eagle on the reverse. It's as if they, they address the complaints of the reverse, and Roosevelt had his way on the outverse. So there you have what Roosevelt did in terms of influencing the designs. And the fact is he had a big hand in it. Was he successful with it? Yes, he was. Taft defeated Bryan in 1908. Bryan chose not to make silver a campaign issue. Uh, the gold coin designs, even the eagle, I think is beautiful compared to what had gone before, but the double eagle, in my opinion, is the best design ever to come out of the mint and be issued for circulation. But still, Roosevelt was sensitive about the, the eagle coin at a memorial held in December of 1908 in Washington for St. Gaudens. He defended it, saying, basically, I get caught up in my work here to quote it, the eagle gold coin uh, characteristically shows liberty in a headdress that is purely American, one of the few wearing gear produced independently in America. It took a great American artist to see that liberty should have something distinctly American about her. Well, that defended Roosevelt, but I would have to disagree with, it, with that. Uh, but he's entitled to his opinion, I, I think, artistically. Uh, we were better off without that headdress. On the other hand, I think that $5 gold piece, particularly when you see it in MS-65, as this example is here, I'll go back to it. When you get the mint luster in that field, it is a spectacular piece. And it's radically different from anything that's been done, uh, had been done up to that point in time. So I, I, I think it's well worth having gone through the motions to do that. Uh, I'll close with one last point on this, and it's with a $10 gold piece. Let me get up. There we go. There are no designer initials on that $10 gold piece. Theodore Roosevelt basically designed that piece. 
Augustus St. Gaudens, on the other hand, is known for putting his initials on anything that he designed and, and sharing it in some instances. He did it with the Washington Inaug uh, Centennial Inaugural Medal uh, in 1889 with Philip Martini. He did it with his brother Louis uh, on the uh, Franklin Medal. He did it with Wyman on the uh, 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 Inaugural Medal. He put his uh, initials boldly on the uh, Double Eagle. They're not here to be found whatsoever. The issue is Theodore Roosevelt's initials belong on here every bit as much as St. Gaudens. It was Roosevelt that put the headdress on Liberty. It was Roosevelt that paired the designs. Uh, you simply put, he did as much as St. Gaudens did on this. On the other hand, Gus knew that there was no way Roosevelt was going to let his initials be put on there. That would have been political suicide for one thing, even though it was deserved or, or merited. So you had no design there, plain and simple. That finishes my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, uh, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And uh, you know what? Maybe we should lobby the Mint to uh, reissue that coin with the, the initials on it, huh? Um, you know, I was also, also going to say that while you were speaking, uh, I got an email um, saying that Harry Bass's Ultra High Relief Double Eagle sold at auction uh, 73 bids at the ANA in uh, Pittsburgh for 4.3 million. Wow, that's a million over anything else that's been, I think, 3.2 was the high before that. Yeah, so 4.3, 73 bids, so strong bidding on that. Wow, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's been a resurgence in St. Gons that started with that auction uh, from that collector of the sculptural works. Uh, yeah. Sometime uh, back in, uh, I guess it was in the spring, you know, the uh, Angel of Victory went for 1.1 million. The Head of Victory went for 173,000. Uh, these are all better prices than you've seen in the last couple of years. Yeah. The, no, it's, it's... the Uniface went for 24,000. Uh, nice numbers. Yeah, it's really amazing. A lot of interest, obviously. So um, happy to open the uh, open the floor to any questions if anybody has any. They're still awake. Did I bore them to death? No. It's just pondering. <clears throat> no, in fact, the um, I thought I just saw somebody's hand go up, but maybe not. No. So one one of the questions that I had actually had to do with the uh, Jean Vier machine that. Yeah. Um, well, so it, it really was St. Gaudens that pushed the mint to acquire uh, the... Absolutely, yeah. Right. So yeah. Had, had there been any interest at all in acquiring the Jean Vier machine before that? Or... Yes. Yes, at the mint. Uh, they knew they needed a new one. Uh, they had considered the Jean Vier machine, and, uh, but they had gone, before they considered the John V.A. machine, they'd been approached by somebody else and Barbara had committed to that other person. Uh, that contract was in place, but they didn't deliver. But that mm -hmm. in turn uh, put the acquisition of the John V.A. machine on hold. And Barbara was content to just kind of let it rock along. Uh, he knew better. You know, they, they sent him over in the fall of 05 to see the latest techniques in the various mints uh, in Europe. So he, he, I call it his grand European vacation, but he went <laughs> over there and, and, and saw what was being done. He knew what the latest was, but he was still content. He had a comfort zone with that old hill machine. You, you take him away from that. Uh, I forget how old the man was, pardon me. I got to get rid of that. There we go. Uh, he, he knew that the, the hill machine needed to be replaced but he just was comfortable with, with doing what he did with the old machine. Yeah. So Roosevelt cleared all that ground clutter out and fixed it. Um, you know, the, the Mint might still have that old uh, Jean Vier machine there. Um, when we were down in Philadelphia um, earlier this year, I was asking uh, one of the, the fellows there whose name skipped in my mind at the moment, but um, they, they do have a good number of Jean Vier machines in storage. Um, really? they, you know, they, they did acquire some, you know, later on, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, he thinks that some of them might date from, you know, the very beginnings of their acquisitions of Jean V machines. So that, that would actually be pretty cool if they still have it. 
I don't doubt it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I see that there's a, uh, a question from Lawrence Edwards here. Um, he's asking, do we see St. Gaudens seated Lincoln behind you? No, no, that uh, good, good eyesight. Uh, uh, that is Daniel Chester French's seated Lincoln. It's from uh, a maquette, but it's a restrike from a, an original maquette. So not quite. I wish it were an original uh, strike from uh, of French's, but it's not. It was done uh, oh, 40 or 50 years ago and given to me by a good friend of mine who was my uh, sculptural editor on Striking Change, Michael Richmond. Very good. Uh, I also see I don't know uh, somebody... gems back there in the background that you can see. Yeah. The head of Vickers downstairs. Yeah. Um, there, there's somebody uh, anonymous in the chat with iPhone 123 who says, uh, great talk. I paused at the Pittsburgh a a meeting to hear Mike. So well, good. You, you got people at, uh, at, at the a a in Pittsburgh. Oh, and there's, there's, uh, oh, that, no, it's, uh, it's Larry. That's ah, I mean. Hey, Larry, how are you? There we go. Very good. Um, and uh, Larry Schwimmer uh, is asking, not a coin, but was Roosevelt also involved with the 1907 spectacular $20 gold coin note? No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, very good. And that correspondence could have been there. And you go in, into his correspondence. First of all, he would go through two or three stenographers a day with his letters and just wear them out. So going through that, I did not go through that page by page. I was looking specifically for addressees in terms of letters sent as well as letters received. That's, that's how you do that. Otherwise you get overwhelmed with that stuff. Roosevelt was an amazing man. I'll go off just a little bit on that. I suspect that if we knew the IQs of all the presidents, he might well have, have the highest one. Uh, he had a photographic memory. He could speed through books and then quote from them. I can't do that. Never could do that. Uh, I hate people that, particularly when they were, I was competing against them in college and trying to make grades. And, you know, they could sit down the night before and, and spend 30 minutes read a chapter and they're, they're done. Not me. <laughs> it didn't work that way. Yeah. Um, I, actually, uh, we, we do have a little bit of time. Um, do you want to tell us about your forthcoming book? Sure. Uh, it is a uh, sequel to uh, Philadelphia, uh, The Men's Strikes Gold, or 1849. Uh, it picks up with the Comstock Lobe, the uh, discovery of the Comstock Lobe. But actually, I pick it up with the segregation of Nevada territory away from Utah. Uh, that was the key element. I'm sorry. Here we go. The, uh, had that not happened in 1861, or 1859 or 60, I should say, that was 61, uh, it would have remained Utah territory. And the Mormon influence on the Comstock load would have competed with the San Francisco banking influence on it. As it was, Nevada being a separate territory, uh, San Francisco easily took control of it. The, uh, for the rest of the 19th century, California effectively had four United States senators once uh, Nevada became a state in 1864. But the amount of silver and gold that came through there was amazing. It literally was a mountain of silver and gold, Mount Davidson. It was just amazing. The, and finally, the, uh, uh, the consolidated Virginia and California mines, the wealth of, of that seam that they discovered in there uh, was beyond comprehension. And that basically just totally screwed up forever, any chance of ever getting back to a 16 to one gold to silver ratio. And as a result of that, with all that gold coming out, you had a two different, you had silver increasing in supply while gold stayed uh, stable. 
basically uh, just enough. It did not even meet demand because a lot of countries over in Europe were going on to the gold standard off of the silver standard. So you basically had deflation in the 1880s and into the 1890s, which resulted in, and silver on the other hand was plentiful. So that resulted in the uh, speech of William Jennings Bryan, don't, cross, don't uh, crucify me on a cross of gold. Uh, he had a point with that because the, uh, what had happened because the governments fixed the price of gold in order for gold to uh, reflect its increased purchasing power, uh, the price of other commodities declined. So you, that's really what you had was a, a really vicious deflation, uh, particularly in the agricultural sections of the United States. Uh, I, I picked that up, walked through it. I talk about the silver dollar, how it got enacted in 1878. There are some colorful stories in here. For instance, the, uh, the legislation passed the Senate. There were three or four senators that were so drunk they were incoherent because anytime you had a nighttime session uh, in the Senate at that point in time, you ran that risk. Uh, I take it forward and bring in Roosevelt. Uh, and it's easy to bring in and understand within the context of this book what Roosevelt was up to. He wanted to, to eliminate silver once and for all as the uh, a political issue. But Roosevelt, he came up in the on the East Coast, but he came up in a very religious household. So uh, gold was, was was it was just logically the 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 it was something of value to him, whereas silver was an element of commerce and nothing more than that. So I take it forward through there, I take it through World War One. Uh, interesting note there. Uh, Wilson ran in 16 to keep us out of war. Meanwhile, the Mint had stopped coinage of uh, gold everywhere except for a, a small amount out in San Francisco where they were still using gold primarily in circulation and began uh, coining the subsidiary silver coins instead to keep their, their workforce in place because if they coined any gold, it was going to leave the country uh, because England was gold was a, a scarce commodity to, to fund World War I. Uh, I talk about uh, the uh, what happens in the 20s, which was basically a flowering of designs uh, with James Earl and Laura Garden Frazier. Uh, Roosevelt and the Gold Recall in 1934. And I take it all the way forward. I skip a lot, but if, if those of us that are old enough to remember the great treasury rate of 1964 for silver dollars, uh, I talk about that and how that came about, uh, as well as the uh, striking of the peace dollar of 64. And I wind the book up uh, with the resurrection of the Morgan and Peace Dollars in 2021 and give you a bit of the inside story that uh, only Tom Urim and I can tell. <laughs> so that's my that's elevator. Okay. That's, how, that's how later this year, right? Uh, I don't know if it's going to get done this year. Uh, maybe by the end of the year, it's 650 pages. That's a tome. It took oh, only 650 pages. pages. Well, I didn't count it. It could be more. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, at least your uh, ANS Magazine article will be out before that. And That's in this sure. next hour, Em and I are going to be uploading it to the printer. So Super. you ANS members should have it on your doorstep in about three weeks or so. So look for that. Um, and Mike, I uh, want to thank you again. That, that was uh, a wonderful presentation. And uh, now we can let you get back to your lunch. So that's... No, I, ha I had lunch. That got done. <laughs> I just, you know, four thirds going to roll around and I'm going to be doing something else. I just, that's right. For some reason, well, the last email came out, I had 430 on there. And I thought, well, that must be right. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, you know, sometimes yeah. uh, luck takes care of fools. Yeah.